the different people that were working and how they had been divided up and, and uh, were attacking this wall, this great project that they had. And, um, and there was some resistance in the beginning, but uh, for the most part, all about chapter three was this is who's working here and this is who's assigned and this is how they're going about it. And uh, very systematic and... Uh, and of course, whenever God's work flourishes, who gets mad? The devil does. And so tonight, we are going to look at chapter 4, and we're going to look at the issue of discouragement, the whys and the, the causes and the cures. And we all have been discouraged at one time or another. Some folks get not just discouraged, they get despondent, they give up hope. Uh, there's one thing to be discouraged. There's another thing just to be totally hopeless. And I personally believe tonight that one of the reasons we have the drug problems that we do is because so many people, especially young people, do not see any hope. And guess what, folks? We have hope. Praise God. We've got the hope. And, uh, but tonight we're going to see how the, uh, the situation is going to work out. But before we look into this subject on the scripture, I, I want to share a couple of interesting stories. And I, I think you'll find them encouraging. Uh, it said, many years ago there was a man in Kentucky who had recently retired from the Postal Service. It said he was sitting on his front porch when his first Social Security check arrived. And he looked at it and he felt frustrated. He said, is this all I have to look forward to for the rest of my life? He, put on a, he had put in a long and hard career and had little to show for it. Was all that work worth the effort? Well, he sat down and he made a list of all of his blessings and the good things that he had going for him. Including that list was his mother's famous recipe for fried chicken, which included 11 herbs and spices. He was the only one who knew that recipe. He went to a nearby restaurant and asked if he could cook the chicken, and they said yes. Pretty soon, it became the most popular item at the restaurant, so he opened his own restaurant, and he called it Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the rest is history. Harlan Sanders was tired and frustrated, but he refused to give up. I thought that was interesting. Now, this one's interesting as well. The Franciscans, the Franciscans were monks, and uh, they were out in California. They were the first ones to systematically grow grapes in California. Now, of course, the grape business of vineyards are huge out in California, but these Franciscan monks were the first one. They grew uh, a muscat grape to make muscatel wine. One year, they had a terrible drought and the grapes literally withered on the vine. They thought they were going to lose everything they had, and they were very discouraged and disappointed. But some of them took those withered grapes to town and sold them as Peruvian delicacies. Now, hold on. And that was the beginning of the Sun Made Raisin Company. That's all the raisins are, just dried up grapes. Those Franciscans had a potentially dangerous problem, or disastrous problem, but refused to give up. I thought that was very interesting when I was reading that, so I wanted to share it with you. So let's, let's just take a look at chapter 4. Uh, we find uh, right off the bat, first, first three verses of chapter 4, discouragement is on the way. It, it is presenting itself in, the, in people and the opponents of God's people. So, if we begin reading, it says, It came to pass that when Sanballat, we've already talked about him earlier, heard that we builded the wall and he was wroth. The word wroth means excessively angry. I mean, foaming at the mouth, mad. He was wroth, angry, and took great indignation, and he mocked the Jews, and he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria, and said, What did these feeble Jews, will they fortify? By themselves, notice each word, each comment has a question mark. It's a question. It's almost a, it is a ridicule. He's making fun of them, mocking them. He said, will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? 
And he's, he's belittling them. He's ridiculing them. Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, was by him, and he said, even that which they build. And I like this. If a fox go up, he shall break down their stone wall. This is the first of three different types of what we call external uh, types of discouragement. The first is ridicule. They just simply belittle them. You ever had anybody make fun of your faith? You, you mean you read your Bible? You don't cuss? You don't go to dirty movies? You actually get up on Sunday morning, go to church? You give money to that place? Are you nuts? That's ridicule. And we find this all of the time in our culture, don't we? The more and more, the longer I live, the more I see evidences in the media uh, that it may be subtle, but it's in, in many ways they are ridiculing the fact that we believe in a God. We believe in a book that's all these many years old, and yet we believe there's a heaven. We believe there's a reason to live right and clean lives to be committed to our spouses, to raise our children in a certain way, to handle our money in a certain way. When we don't do it like everybody else, we get ridiculed. And sometimes, many times, those things can cause us to be discouraged. Um, but I, I just want you to know tonight, if you've ever had, anybody ever had that, somebody ridicule you for, for your faith? Sure. I, I mean, it may be subtle, but absolutely. I remember when I was in high school, uh, I purposed to carry my Bible to high school with me. And uh, for the first couple of weeks, I hid it under my books. <laughs> and God really got on my heart and said, hey, if you're going to take it, show it. So next, Sunday, next day, I took it and put my Bible around the top, and I got, holy Joe, look, Mel's a holy Joe, you know. And... Making fun, ridicule it. I say you're in good company. If you think back to David, when David uh, went out to meet Goliath, what did Goliath say? Y you? You're a shrimp? And you come to me with a sling? And have you seen my sword? Have you seen my armor? You don't have any armor. And he ridiculed David. Only trouble was it wasn't long that he wasn't ridiculing David. He was laying dead. So we're in good company. I, I think about Jesus Christ himself. At the end of his days when he was taken before the chief priest and arrested, and they, they mocked him. He says he's the king of the Jews. He was the king of the Jews. And when they got through with him, he turned, they turned him over to Herod, and Herod mocked him. And when they, he got through with him, he turned him over to the soldiers, and the soldiers mocked him as he carried the cross up the hill and hung on that cross that day. And he, the words would come out, said he said he will save others, but he cannot even save himself. But folks, Jesus didn't come down. He stayed there on that cross, and the last words out of his mouth was, it is finished. Praise God, it is finished. You're going to get ridiculed. Those on the outside, um, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, God's Spirit came upon those disciples and, and they began to speak in tongues and they began to preach and, and people were being saved. And the others said, these men are drunk in the middle of the day. They ridiculed them. So if you stand for Jesus... Some folks might say unkind things about you. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Verse number seven. We're going to skip it down to verse seven. Here's the second tactic that uh, was used. It says, and then came to, it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth. Here goes another angry thing. They were mad. And they conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. So now it's not just about words anymore. 
Now they're going to take action. And this is what we call intimidation. Now, what's interesting to me about this, and, and, and we've seen it right in our own world here recently in recent days, the, these men, if we had a map tonight, if I had a map to show you, these men, literally, these people, these, these nations and these leaders, they encircled Jerusalem. All right? They literally dwelt on every side. So Jerusalem uh, and the Jews that were trying to set up Jerusalem, the Jews were, were basically trapped in there by these folks. So at any time they wanted to, without a wall, Without any time they wanted to, any of these men could have come in and, and, and had been persecuting the Jews and, and stealing from them and keeping them on, on, on guard and, and keeping them from being able to fulfill God's will. So, but here's the thing that is interesting to me. They were enemies of each other. But when it comes to God's stuff, all of the enemies of each other will come together to stand against God's stuff. Have we seen this recently in our world? It's, I mean, totally irrational alliances between people that normally would hate each other, but all of a sudden we have a cause. And whether it's the blacks thing or whatever it is, now everybody's on board. I, I give you an example here just a few years ago. Uh, um, several of our key government leaders, several of them, came out very adamantly against same-sex marriage. They were against it. It's not right. It shouldn't be legalized. Yes, there was a state here that did this and stuff, but for the most part, no, this was wrong. But it was almost overnight that the switch flipped somewhere and somebody put together an alliance and people that stood on both sides of the aisle in both parties all of a sudden had a common cause and they came together and within a very brief period of time it was legalized for two men to marry or two women to marry. Now, the problem is we can't get Christians to come together. <laughs> But when the devil's got a cause, he can get his crowd to come together and intimidate, uh, try to intimidate uh, God's people. Verse 11 and 12, the third external cause of discouragement. Notice what it says, and our adversaries said. Now, who are the adversaries? These folks we just read about, right? And the adversary said, they shall not know, that is, the Jews will not know, neither will they see, till we come in among them, um, uh, in amongst, midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. What is this? This is conspiracy. Conspiracy. When you, you, you know something's not right, and you know something's going on, but you can't figure it in. And, and, and what does it do with your head? It works on your head. What, what are they going to do? What are they going to say? How are they going to respond? What, what happens if I do this? And you begin to second guess yourself. And what happens when you second guess yourself is you get what? Discouraged. You're in the minority. You're in the minority. You know that. They're in the majority. It looks like they have the advantage. But instead of coming forward right up against you, they began to sneak around, and, and then we have a conspiracy, sneaky, underhanded betrayal. You see, part of this group, and part of the reason they have this message, is because some of the neighboring Jews who live outside of Jerusalem have made alliances. They probably married some of the women from these, these groups and these nations. And, and so they got family ties over there. Yeah, they're Jews, but they've got this deal. You know, my wife's second cousin on her mother's side is one of these things. And, and so they're carrying this message back to the Jews and say, you know what they said? Let me tell you what they said. Now I'm just saying, what happens? It plants discouragement, and doubt, and, and fear in a person's heart. Now, this is all external, but there's also internal means of discouragement. Pressure from without will often cause problems within. 
Opposition from the outside can result in discouragement inside a person because we forget what's true. We start to believe what our enemies are saying. I remember years ago, Chuck Swindoll, I I love to hear Chuck preach. I mean, he's just a man of God and he can just take the word and just bless you with it. And uh, just just a great man, still pastoring at 85 years old. Um, Has a church of thousands of people. Uh, out in Texas. But he was talking one time in one of his uh, messages years ago, and he was talking about um, some of these uh, big name preachers. And he said, you know, the problem with that is they begin to believe their own PR. Now stop and think about that for a minute. They begin to believe their own PR. Maybe I'm as great as they think I am. Maybe I'm as wonderful as people say that I am. Maybe I'm as good as what that ad that put on TV said that I was. And what happens to the devil? What does he do? He works on your head. And then you find out you're not, and then you fall on your face. So there are some internal things, because we forget what's true, and we begin to believe what our enemies are saying. Now, what are some of these internal factors? Let's verse 10. Verse 10, there's three of them right there in that verse. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burden is decayed. Now, that's a fancy way to say what? Tell me what it means. They got what? Tired. They were tired. This was a big job. Two to three miles of wall, 15 feet high, four four feet thick, uh, and then the gates, seven gates to be built. And notice, they've already built it halfway. You think they got tired? Shoot, these aren't builders. These aren't professional builders. I mean, there are some among them. We went last week, we looked at them. I mean, there was a perfume maker and a jeweler and a goldsmith and ladies. And, and so there were all kinds of people building. And get this, they didn't just have to build it. They had to clean away the mess first so they could build it. So there is this idea of, of fatigue and weariness. Anybody ever get tired and get discouraged when you get tired? Amen. My wife will tell me sometimes, she said, you're getting discouraged, go take a nap. I I said, I've been waiting for you to tell me that the whole day. (laughs) Uh, I think one of the the greatest um, examples and illustrations from the Bible in this area. If you remember the story of Elijah, when Elijah confronted Ahab on, and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and they had the contest, you know, and God sent down the fire, and, and uh, they killed all the prophets, and, and so Elijah takes off, and he's running, and he hears that uh, Jezebel is going to kill him. Now, he just confronted the, the prophets of Baal. I mean, he had a contest. God just answered by fire. But, but he, he gets scared and he's afraid and he's discouraged. So he turns and he runs way out into the desert in the wilderness and he falls down under a bush and he said, God, just let me die because there's nobody that loves you like I do. There's the only one, nobody left but me. I'm the only one. And that's pretty much how we feel when we get discouraged, right? Nobody's ever been through what I've been through. Nobody ever felt what I feel. Nobody's ever experienced what I've experienced. And what did God do? How did God remedy a situation? What's the first thing God did for, for Elijah? Anybody know? Remember? He sent an angel to him. And he what? He fed him, and he told him to sleep. And he slept, and he woke up, and he fed him again, and told him to sleep some more. And then he got up in the strength of that. Sometimes, folks, the most spiritual thing we could do is rest. Even Jesus with his disciples, if you go back and read the Gospels, he would be along teaching and he would do something magnificent and a great powerful uh, uh, miracle and and then he would turn to them and say, let's come aside for a while. They, they, They didn't hit it preaching every day and miracles every day. Jesus, because he was human, he had a human body, he got weary, he got tired. He said, come on guys, let's go aside to tire and rest and renew our strength. So one of the problems here is that just fatigue. They, they were working hard. I mean, they were going after it. The other thing about it is the fact that the, the, the hardest 
point in any job is when you're half done. When you start off, you know, you, 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 you're, you've got your zeal worked up and you've got your energy moving and, and, and boy, you're just tearing after it and, and you're seeing progress and things are going good and, and you've been working at it really hard, but you're starting to wear down, but, but you see that you still got the other half of the wall to build. And that's one of the toughest, toughest places. He said, just, just get some rest. They, they need some rest. And then verse 10, the second part of verse 10, it says, and Judah said, the strength of the bearers, the workers of the burden is decayed. They're, they're just tired. Down south, we say they wore out. Then he says, secondly, he said, and there is much rubbish, much rubble. Junk was everywhere. Remember, the wall had been built, had been torn down. They had b tried to build it up again, and they had tore that down. They had never succeeded in getting the wall back up. But each time they would try, they would come and tear it down. So there were a lot of junk around, a lot of rubble. Before they could actually build anything, they had to clean up some stuff. They had to get some things out of the way. And he said, here we are, and we build the wall halfway up, and there's still a lot of rubble. Old stones, blocks, timbers, mortar. Can I tell you something tonight? And I believe this with all my heart. One of the reasons that so many Christians are discouraged in their Christian life is because they've never cleared away the rubble. They're trying to build on junk. You say, what do you mean rubble? Well, let me put it the way Jesus or Paul put, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews put it in Hebrews 12.1. He said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How do we do that? We need to put away every weight that easily besets us and, and the sin, the sin that besets us. In other words, you don't run a race in combat boots and an overcoat. You, you're going to be wore out. You can't win if you run that way. You have to take away some stuff. And see, this is part of what we forget as a Christian. We think, oh, praise God. I go to the altar. I bow my head. I ask Jesus to come into my heart. I'm on my way to heaven. I got my free ticket, and I'm going to heaven one day. I'm all done. No, that's just a start. It is the beginning and from that point to the day that we leave this earth, there is this process whereby we are putting off the rubble and putting on holiness. We are putting away the things that hinder us, and we are putting on the things that enable us to run the race victorious. But folks, if you don't deal with the rubble, eventually it will discourage you. God, how many times have I told you I'm going to stop doing that, and I still do it? Now, don't raise your hand. You ever thought that? Ever said that? Sure. That's why we put away the old man, while at the same time we are putting on the new man. That old person, that old man of sin, walking, learning to walk in the Spirit, what does he say in Galatians? If you learn to walk in the Spirit, you do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So he said they are discouraged. They are discouraged, frustrated because of all of the rubble, all of the junk around. Next thing in verse number 10. He said the strength of the bearers of burden is decayed. They're weary, weary wore out, tired. They need to rest. And there is much rubbish it's discouraging them. That's frustration. And then finally, he says, and um, so that we are not able to build the wall. This is fear. Fear. Why are they afraid? They are afraid what, because of what they said. Right up there, verse 7 and 8. What did they say? We are your enemies. You are encircled on every side. And we are going to come get you. You're in our 
sights. We've got you in the crosshairs. We are coming to get you, and you are defeated. Look who we are, who we are and look what we have, and look what you, who you are, and look what you have, and look what you've got ahead of you, and you don't know anything about building walls. And, and, and all of a sudden, they begin to fear, and they begin to believe not what they knew to be true, that God was with them, that God had opened the door, provided. He provided the permission of the king, the protection of the king, and the provision of the king. And God had sent Nehemiah there, and, and he had a plan, and, and they were all on board until they began to listen to the enemy, and now fear sets in. And when you're afraid, you can't be optimistic when you're afraid. We are not able to build the wall. Notice verse 12. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, and they said unto us, how many times? Ten times. Like we needed reminded, right? Did you hear what they said? Does that remind you of this situation with the COVID-19, the coronavirus, every day? Did you hear what that doctor said? Did you hear what this is going to be? Did you hear this? Every day, Tim would come in. Did you see this? Did you hear what that doctor said? Did you hear how many people died over here? Did, did you, did, what, what does that perpetuate? Does it perpetuate faith? No, it perpetuates fear. And God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of what? Sound mind. A sound mind means clear thinking. Fear will discourage you. Fear will stop you. It not only leads to discouragement, but it sets us up to be deceived. Here's the interesting point. Guess what? The enemy never attacked them. All they did were mouthing it. They were big talkers. They never attacked them. Not to, you read the rest of the book. They never attacked them. They didn't have to. Their words were enough to stop them. Their words were enough to make, fe- make them fearful. And I'm telling you what, there are a lot of Christian people sitting in churches today who have potential f- to serve God. They have, call- they have the call of God on their life. God has gifted them and enabled them to do something, to make an impact for God. A- and yet fear has kept them from doing so. I'm afraid of what they'll say. I'm afraid of they'll laugh. I'm afraid I won't do well. I'm afraid that, you know, this won't happen or that won't happen. Well, fear will kill kill you. It'll kill your zeal for God, and it'll keep you from enjoying some of the blessings of seeing God use you. Because remember, folks, when we do it God's way, God gets the glory, not us. But he never calls you to anything that he won't equip you to do it. So, there's this external or internal uh, matter of fear. But there's good news tonight. And the good news is that discouragement is not, it is a curable disease. It, you can overcome it. So how do they overcome it? Well, verse 4 and 5. The first thing they did was they, or and he did, Nehemiah did, is what? Did he, got, did he climb up in front of these sand ballot and he said, let me tell you a few things. Is that what he did? No. Who did he talk to? He talked to God. He talked to God and let God do his talking for him. To his enemies. I like this. It says in verse 4, it says, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Now, God, here's what I want you to do. Now, please pay attention to this prayer because this is really an interesting prayer. God, I want you to turn their reproach upon their own heads. I want you to give them for a prey to the land of captivity. I want you to not cover their iniquity. God, don't forgive them. But I want their sin, don't blot their sin out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. That doesn't sound like loving Jesus. (laughs) Right? What does Jesus tell his people? If somebody does bad to you, do you return evil for evil? What do you do? You overcome evil with good. If you remember that somebody has ought against you, you leave your gift at the altar and you go and you be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. This doesn't sound like Jesus' prayers. We have to remember it's not Jesus' prayer. This is Old Testament economy. 
And here's the key to his prayer. He was not praying for personal vindication. He was praying for God to vindicate his name. Because you see, when Nehemiah looked at Israel and looked at Ju the Judah and the people of God, he saw God. They were God's representative. And so when these men were saying what they were doing and acting the way they were acting, he said, this isn't against us, this is against him. And God, you, you protect your name. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't forgive them. You, you put it on them because they're dishonoring you. But he didn't go to him and point his finger in his face and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix you guys. No, no, he just let God do his talking for him. And then, of course, uh, if you go there, um, verse 6, verse 1, he said, after I got through praying, what did I do? He went back to work. <laughs> so we builded the wall. They just went back to work. So the first answer, but that didn't solve the problem because we go verse 7 and 8, and, uh, and then there's the, they're back again, and they're making more threats and so forth. So go to verse 9. Nevertheless, no matter what they said, nevertheless, what did they do? They pray. And notice the, the second word in that verse. Nevertheless, who prayed? We pray. It's corporate. They prayed together. They prayed for the same purpose. They prayed towards the same goal. We prayed, made our prayer to God, and, and set a watch. In other words, okay, God, it's all up to you. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. If they want to play on us, that's fine. No. You say, well, that's not much faith. No, that's a lot of wisdom. <laughs> well, I forget which you the which the great general was said one time, he said, you trust God and keep your powder dry. It's just simple wisdom. He said, we set a watch. We started putting guards out. We're not going to let them sneak up on us. We trust God. But we're going to be wise about what we do. That's what James says when you fall into a difficult situation, that ask God for wisdom. Because he'll give wisdom to anybody that asks it in faith believing. He'll give it to you or me. Unfortunately, too many times we depend upon our own cleverness because they pray and they build the wall. I, I, I want to leave Nehemiah for just one second. I want you to look at a verse, a scripture that I think goes with this in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. And this is my own personal opinion, but I believe that one of the reasons the church today, and I'm talking about the church universal, is in trouble. And it is in trouble. It's because we have gotten away from this verse and we have depending our own devices, our own smartness, our own methodology to do for us what only God can do. But notice what it says in verse 3. He says, for we walk in the flesh, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Who are we warring against? Well, we war against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places, right? That's why he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be stand against the wiles of the devil. You put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of God, the peace, and so forth. He says, we, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons, here it is, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't hire a PR man to come and, and promote our church. We promote our church by sharing the gospel. He says, they're not carnal, but notice this, and I thank God for this, but they are what? Mighty. Mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Oh, it's so big, and the devil's got so power, and, and, and the world is so strong. Well, who's the God? Who's God? Who sits on the throne in heaven? Who causes the sun to come up and go down the seas to stay within their boundaries? Isn't that what he asked Job in the book of Job? He said, where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? Where were you when I set the boundaries of the sea? Can you tell me? He said, oh, man, I was a fool, God. And guess what? That's the same God we have and serve. He said, the, the methods, the, pr the principles of God are mighty 
but yet we don't utilize those principles. We try to come up with a new program or we try to come up with a new gadget or, or some kind of gimmick. We don't need gimmicks. We need God's power to do it, to win. And so they, they pray. Now, what else did they do? Go back to Nehemiah. Verse 13. They planned and they encouraged. Verse 13. Then set I in the lower places before the, uh, behind the wall, and on the higher places I set even the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. First thing he did, he said, we got a plan. What's our plan? We're going to put some people with some swords out here. We're going to put some people with some bows and spears. And some of you are at work and some of you will guard us. We're not going to let them sneak up on us. We're trusting in God. It's God that's going to deliver them. But we're not going to sit here and just say, give them an invitation. And he says, verse 14, and he encouraged them. He said, I said to the people, be not afraid of them. Why? Because we have enough guys that know how to shoot a bow? Because we have some capable swordsmen? No, because the Lord is on our side, and he will fight for us. Remember Gideon and his great army? I need somebody to lead the army. Gideon was a chicken. He wouldn't go. God finally drug him out reluctantly, give him an army, of thousands of men. He said, you've got too many. <laughs> no, Lord, you don't know how many they got. Doesn't matter how many they got. You got too many. We got to get rid of some of them. And he put him through a series of tests until he was down to how many? Does a man remember? 300. Had 300. He said, okay, so how are we going to go? Well, I want you to get some trumpets, and I want you to get some pitchers, and, a, and a, some candles, and some lights. Yep, that sounds like a good plan to defeat an army. What does that verse said that we just read? The weapons of God are mighty. <laughs> Praise God to the pulling down of stronghold. And guess who won that battle that day? God won the battle through 300 men who had a heart to fight. He's saying to them, don't forget whose side we're on. Don't forget who's on our side. And he encourages them to uh, keep fighting. Uh, verse 17, it says, he says to them, they that which builded the sword and they bear burdens with those that laid it, every one of them with his hand, wrought with the work and with the other hand held a weapon. By the way, guess what our sword is? Right here, that's the sword of the Spirit. It's one of those weapons. It, the better you know this book, the stronger you can be in battle. All right, one more thing. Verse 15 through uh, 15 through 23, the end of the chapter. I'm going to read them. And it says, um, And it came to pass when our enemies heard it, it was known unto us. And God brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, every man his work. And it came to pass that from that time forth, the half of the servants wrought in the work, and the other half them which held the spears, the shields, the bows, the, the uh, aborigines, and the rulers that were behind all the house of Judah, they which builded the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one of them with his hand wrought in the work. And with the other hand, they held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side. Oh, folks, we need to keep our sword close. And so they builded, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Now, don't miss this one. Don't miss that last statement. What would they need a trumpeter for? What would the trumpeter do? What was his job? Sound the alarm and call for action. And where was he? What has he said? Where was the trumpeter? He was right by Nehemiah's side. Because Nehemiah is surveying the work. He is constantly in a state of, of examining what's going on and alertness. And he says, he's going to be right there, and I'm going to give him the word. And when you hear the trumpet, you know what to do. You throw down your trowel and get out your sword. But they never came. They're just trying to intimidate and he says, in what place, verse 20, in what place therefore you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither to us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of them which held the spears from the rising of the morning to the stars appear. Now they're not just working to the end of the day. 
8 to 5 or 9 to 5 or 8 to 4.30. No, they're working until the stars come out. They're working until dark. Why? Because they're going to build the wall. They pressed on. They just dug in. Did the enemy go away? Did the enemy go away? No. Do you think they're still intimidated and ridiculed? They tried to, but they just kept pressing on. Just kept pressing on. God frustrated their plan, and not a bow or attack ever materialized. Verse 23, so neither I nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men of the guard which follow me, none of us put off our clothing save that everyone put them off for washing. And they finished the wall. Praise the Lord. It's natural, folks. I'm going to promise you, if you stand for Jesus and you try to live for Jesus and you try to live a life of faith and honor God with your life and your family and your finances, you're going to face discouragement because the enemy doesn't like it. I promise you that. We can't control the outside forces. Oh, well, we'll vote for this guy. Well, you can vote for him or her or whoever they are, but the enemy's going to still keep coming. Because the enemy hates us, and he hates our God. But we can control how we respond in those times when the enemy is trying to, whether it's external or whether it's internal, we can control. We choose how we respond. And Nehemiah and his people built the wall in 52 days. An engineering marvel. No cranes, no back hoes, no track hoes, no bulldozers. Just men and women putting their back into work to build a wall. And I'm on God's team. And I hope you too are too. I hope this will help you and encourage you the next time the enemy gets after you and tries to discourage you. Any questions, comments? All right, let's be dismissed then. Lord, It's one thing for us to read this passage of Scripture. It's one thing for us to see these principles, causes externally and internally. It's a whole other thing for us to do. When we're being intimidated, when we're being ridiculed, when people in our jobs and our families Ridicule us for our faith. Ridicule us for our stand. And we teach our children purity and honor and integrity. When everybody else's kids are sleeping around and cheating on their tests and living like the world. Oh, you, you make your kids go to church. You, you make your daughters dress like young women. You make your sons treat girls with honor. You don't go out and blow your money. You just give it to church and, and we'll be ridiculed for that. And we try to share our faith with people that need Jesus. There's going to be some people that will intimidate us. Help us, Lord, to remember whose side we're on. Help us, Lord, to stand strong. To keep on keeping on to keep this sword handy, to make it an integral part of our life. And the enemy cannot and will not win. Thank you for the example of Nehemiah that you left for us in your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.